and it was spread along the, the field. Smelly stuff. Oh, it was. Oh, I mean, you, the clothes that you wore at that gig, you'd have to burn them after Seriously? that. Seriously? Uh, a chain of lakes here. A chain of a them? A chain of lakes, like a string of pearls, all the way down to Limerick. And so that's the only kind of newt that we actually have, is a smooth newt. Yes. Are you trying to pick her up? Can you do I'm that? I'm trying. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. oh, I think that might be a male because he's got a nice orange underbelly. Right. That's what we'd have now for Mike to say, Joe. They'll be a Mike to say, fish. They're quite small, aren't they? They're yeah, still yeah, pretty small. Yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> They're slippery as well. This is Cavalier 2 for Joy. Cavalier 2 for Joy. Yeah, and Cavalier 2 for Joy. He reckons he's a boss. Right. He's been our longest serving stallion. Right. Has he got <laughs> um, an air of authority about him? Yeah, yes, an air yes. of authority, yeah. yeah. I think by this stage the new Talert has gone out and they've all gone, they've all gone undercover. There's usually a good reason why any town is located where it is. Something that triggers off its existence, initiates its history. Any number of factors will decide whether that town grows and prospers. Its natural resources, its raw materials, the enterprise of its people and so on. But very often there's just one thing that kicked off the story. An inciting incident, if you like, that made somebody someday in the distant past stop and say this would be a good place in which to settle. Equally often, that reason is shrouded in the mists of time. But in the case of the place I'm in today, that inciting incident will never be forgotten because it's enshrined in the name of the place. In English, it means the mouth of the ford of the Birches. Welcome to Bally Bay in County Monaghan. The ford in question that gave the town a reason to be here would have been found where the Dremore River makes its leisurely departure from Loch Major and winds its way under the new bridge and past a row of juvenile silver birches, planted here in recent years to commemorate the bestowal of that name. From the lakeside, a ring of gentle drumlins rises up, some bearing traces of the rafts that would have overlooked the territory of the McMahons who held sway in Monaghan up until the mid-1600s, others shouldering the more durable traces of loftier, less worldly aspirations. Another drumlin bears the weight of the town of Bally Bay itself, its streets and buildings hugging the still discernible contours that modern traffic makes light of, but which, I'm sure, punctured many a draft horse back in the days when linen was king and the market house a palace of local industry. When this was erected, the country was in the throes of famine and the Leslies were landlords. Their family tree fairly bristled with bishops, archdeacons and rectors of the established church. Yet the character of much of this area throughout the 18th and 19th centuries was decidedly Scots Presbyterian, with ministers of that faith playing leading roles in radical movements like the United Irishmen and the Tenant Right Campaign. The main street of Bally Bay still boasts a number of long-established family businesses and in the back room of this particular trading post, the business is local history. Padder Murnane, along with his brother Jim, now sadly deceased, produced an extraordinarily detailed chronicle of the life and times of Bally Bay and its people. Away from the cosy clutter of the study above the shop, on a quiet fishing platform at the edge of Loch Major, Padder outlines in wonderfully abbreviated fashion how you grow a town from nothing more than a ford. You had a centre of activity in Carrington Cross, South yeah. Monaghan. You had much similar in North Monaghan, in Monaghan Town. In Clonus, in the west, you had Clonus back by Enniskillen. And on the east coast, you had Dundalk and the Port of Green Ore. Yeah. And the converging roads between those centres was Bally Bay. It was Bally Bay. The, where those converged was the town of Bally Bay. So what was... It, 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 the nucleus of the town... Yeah was at that crossroads. So it was almost like at, at the centre, e equidistant from all these other and, places. Is that and right? geographically, it's the centre of County Monaghan. Of course, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there's the ford of the Birches, just as we come in, we cross the bridge, and that's the ford of the Birches. Right. And so that, so that, that fording place started off uh, a wee nucleus of a very small exactly. hamlet, in other words. And, and the other significant point about it the Drawer River runs through the town there, runs down through Cotill into the Shannon, and it was the only ford, which right. was a, an yeah. access point from one to the other. Mm. The rest of it was all bog and lake I and see. river, yes. deep river. There was no bridge there at all. They crossed the ford 
and there were stepping stones for the pedestrians. It was an important crossing point. Exactly. And, and when you have a crossing point, you had people coming along, I presume, with horses, with carts, and they would need serviced by farriers, by blacksmiths, right. etc. And, and a shop would open up and another shop would exactly. open up. Exactly, that's how it exactly developed. Where you had horse traffic, you needed blacksmiths, farriers, saddlers, you had coaches and carts, you needed carpenters, you needed coach menders, and all this, these trades developed around the town. And from that then you had, uh, I suppose, inns or com accommodation for people passing. You had small huckster shops. And that's, that's how it grew. That's how it grew. That's yeah, how it then labourers came in or walked there. Mm. The place developed from nothing. The central location of Bally Bay in the county made it a convenient rallying point for all sorts of political meetings, parades and processions. The so-called Monster Tenant League meeting of January 1848 took place here. But easy access to the town also ensured that its markets and fairs were well attended. Bally Bay became famous for its horse fairs, more of which later. But the basis of much of the local economy was, of course, linen. For the small farmers of the area, the main cash crop was flax. The farmer grew his flax, he scotched it, he wove it, he spun it, and he wove it in his own uh, loom, in his own house. And after a week's weaving, he took it into the market here in town, and the buyers and the drapers were here to buy it, mm. and then it was taken to the mills and washed, bleached, beetled, lapped and taken to the market, to the, to the Linden Hall in Dublin for international sale. So it would be fair to say that practically every farmer in these parts was involved in that trade in yes. some capacity. He uh, gave a small, perhaps a quarter of an acre, or maybe a half an acre, yeah. uh, to the growing of flax. Yes. It was his living. Probably the downside of that is whenever linen became unprofitable, you know, whenever cotton took over from yes, linen, yeah. so many people were suddenly found themselves without that cash crop, without that income. Is that the right. case? That's, that happened. Yeah. That happened in the early thirties, and the Creve, the mills up around north, up in the Creve area, mm. where the bleach mills were, and the beetling mills, they faded out, and the workers there. They emigrated to the eastern states, to Massachusetts and to Rhode Island mm. because they found comparable work there. Right, they had skills that they took they with them. Skills, right. They had skills, yeah. they had skills that they took out. Yeah. They were washers, they weren't dyers, they didn't know dyeing, but they, they knew the industry and they got plenty of work in Rhode Island particularly, in Massachusetts, mm. in, in the weaving industry. Mm. That pattern of emigration to the eastern shores of America had been established back in 1764, when a remarkable exodus took place from the Bally Bay area. A seceding Presbyterian minister named Thomas Clark, who was then minister of Cahan's congregation, called upon his flock to uproot themselves and their families from Monaghan and to journey with him in search of a new beginning in the new world. The Reverend Clark must have had great powers of persuasion. Some 300 Presbyterians did exactly that. When he left here and took so many local people from his own congregation with him, this was a, a, an area of high concentration of what we would call Scottish settlers. Scottish yes, the Scots Irish. Isn't that right? The Scots Irish. Did that change the character of the place in any sense? No, or, or there was not still a plenty of people of that religion left in the area, yes? Not a terribly lot because the population at the time was pretty high. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, possibly 300 out of it. Well, for the first two or three years, yes. It would have made it a difference. Would have, it would yeah. have made a difference. Yeah. It would have made a difference. Yeah. But they walked from Cahans. That's the amazing thing about these people. The congregated at the church and they left there with all their, their provisions for the way. They left with their farm tools, their looms, their spinning wheels, and they carried them from Bunny Bay to the Narrow Water. My goodness, right. And there's a place quite near Newry, it's Clark's Bridge, and it's believed that he stayed overnight there at that bridge on his way to New York. And that's how it got its name, you well, think? Well, I, I believe, we believe that it was yeah. because of his clerks. Yeah. That was his hall point. 
mm. you stayed over a point be between Cat and, and the Dower Water. My goodness, right. So they took all that they would need with them to, to ply their skills and their yes. trade out in the new world, as it were. Exactly. I see, I see. Would they even have taken, they wouldn't have taken flax plants with them at all, do you think? No, that, no, 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 no. That, that, that was available. That was out that there was already? Available. But they didn't rush into cultivation. The big problem was getting the place ready, to yeah. uh, taking down the trees and logging it off to the mills. Mm. That was their main income at that mm. time. They were hard working people, weren't they? They were hard working days? people. Yeah, yeah. And the, the food supply wasn't that good and they spent a lot of their time hunting. Yes, yes. Yeah, so mm. it wasn't easy for them. Mm. If the milk and honey of the promised land did not flow quite so freely as had been expected, then the land they'd left behind had its own share of hardship yet to come. What those Cahans emigrants did miss out on was the heyday of the linen mills in the 1800s, when the topography of the Bally Bay area proved to be its most valuable asset. There's nothing unusual these days about Irish Americans returning to the old soil to trace their ancestral roots. But sometimes the people who turn up in such quests could be unexpected. For instance, there was a James Jackson born in Bally Bay in 1782. And at the age of just 17, he emigrated to America, where, among a number of successful enterprises, he owned near Nashville, Tennessee, a cotton plantation worked by a large number of slaves. He had a large family, ten children in all, and one of them was also called James. Now, he had a distinguished career fighting for the Confederates during the American Civil War, when he was wounded on 15 different occasions, having lost an arm in the process. Mind you, he might have thought that he had a lot to fight for, because he was also a slave-owning plantation owner. He also had a large family, nine legitimate children and at least one other child that we know of to a black slave worker who was a weaver on his father's plantation. And that child turned out to be the grandmother of the man who returned to Bally Bay to trace his ancestral roots. By that stage, he was a world expert on roots. His name was Alex Haley. Yes, you might remember Alex Haley, not necessarily as the Irish-American descendant of the Jacksons of Bally Bay, but perhaps as the African-American descendant of Kunta Kinte, the hero of his book and the subsequent hugely successful television series, Roots. The Jacksons, who did not emigrate to America and did not own slaves, did pretty well for themselves in and around Bally Bay. They were one of the main driving forces behind the linen industry, which flourished here between 1750 and 1830. During that time, the two adjoining lakes here at Creve provided a never-ending water supply to power a series of bleaching and beetling mills, which delivered high-quality finished linen cloth to the Dublin market. After 1830, the linen trade dried up. But farmers in this area continued to supply good quality flax right up into the 1960s. George Montgomery has reason to recall those days in vivid detail. I remember flax being grown and I pulled flax as a young boy and you see, you used to gather the groups together. Uh, you'd, you'd say now your neighbour was pulling today, tomorrow then we'd go and pull for him. And I remember one one field and I think there was about 80 people there oh, and they'd all be pulling in a row and then they'd, they'd come with the carts to dra draw to the dams. For the retting? From the retting and then when yeah. the retting, it was about 10 or 14 days I think, yeah. then when that was coming out you, you, you knew about that, the smell. You, rem you remember it actually retting? Uh, I, I remember it, yes I remember it and I remember when they pulled it out of the hole, you yeah. were up up to here maybe in water yes and then it was put out on the bank then it was taken and it was spread along the the field smelly stuff oh it was oh i mean you, we, the clothes that you wore at that you'd, you'd have to burn them after seriously that. Uh, oh, oh, right, right, right. then you laid it out and then it dried and then when it was dried you gathered it up and what the, i think it's called gated put it into a sort of sheaf like yes, yes. and then eventually it was tied up and ricked 
put in a big rick and left there for, and I think it was covered with maybe rushes to prevent the rain getting in. And then it was taken from that to the scotch mills right. and then scotched. And then after, whenever you had that scotched, you brought that to the market then and it was sold and you got so much of stone yeah. according to the quality of it. Of course, flax was by no means the only thing local farmers produced. The market house, built by the Leslies as a famine relief scheme in 1848, was also the centre of exchange for hayseed, grass seed, corn, potatoes, turnips and other root crops. It was also the town hall, the courthouse, the library, a temporary school and the place you posted your letters when Victoria ruled the empire. When George was a child, it was still a multi-purpose building. When I was a child, it was certainly open. I remember it, uh, uh, and uh, there used to be on the top layer, because they used to, that used to be where the court sat. Oh, but then, in other times, they'd have concerts and things in there. Never, I remember whenever I was a child going to see, there was a character called Bamboozle him. I've heard of him. Did you? Yes, yes. I, well, I remember right. going to see him there. Right, right. And also... He was a magician? He was. Or? Right, and right. And you see... Oh, if, you bamboozled him? Uh, yeah, yeah, you went up on the stage, do you see, and he'd do a trick. Yeah. And uh, all the, of course... I was satisfied was you got a, a box of uh, maybe snakes and ladders or something if you went up. I so, see. of course, I was up. You and, were up. And, then, <laughs> and got it. No. Yeah, how you did the trick, I don't know. Do you remember what the but trick was, by any chance? No. Something about pouring milk and, and it seemed to come down at, yeah. at your trouser legs and yet you wouldn't <laughs> wear. Right. Were, so, Bamboozler, you, you actually had, had a face-to-face -face encounter with Bamboozler <laughs> when you loved to tell a tale. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's, yeah, that is yeah, amazing. Yeah. The innocent entertainment that George describes belongs to a distant era. An era when the fields around us would have supported many another crop besides the vast acreage of grass that we see today. But there is another abundant resource in these parts, aside from good farming land, good farming water. John Connolly has brought three basic elements together to start a whole new era of farming in the Bally Bay area. Good clean water, which he draws from a board well. A fish, which up to now we haven't really valued in this country, but which is hugely popular on the continent, and his own imagination and enterprise. The perch that John farms in Bally Bay might well be the perch that you and I might adventurously opt for when we go on holiday and fancy something slightly more exotic on the menu. You began life, or you began your professional life as a butcher, isn't that's it? Right, that's right, that's right, yeah. What, what, what took you into this kind of uh, thing? Well, I sort of had something in me, uh, if you know, in the back of my mind, maybe to bring something to Bally Bay at some stage in my life. So, uh, myself and other fellow that had a company uh, split it up and then I invested into this here. Right. I sort of always had a long to do something different. But why perch? Because, I mean... Uh, I mean well, it, well we, it, we, got a letter, it, we got a lot of input from uh, BAM. BAM had done a lot of research on the perch. Right. Had said there was a big market for it. Uh, trout and salmon are, you know, what I mean? we know about yes, them. Yes, yes, everybody knows about that. So what we are doing here would be unique. Like there's no other, there's no other country as far on as we are, like as Ireland is at the moment. And and perch wouldn't have been a fish for the table in this country, sure no, wouldn't. No, uh, no, perch would have been all as class at a pearl man's dinner, yeah. you know, because it's full of bones and there's scales on it. But, right. but with machinery now and everything else, show you like, and there's a uh, there's a big market for it in. Uh, the Alpine regions of Europe, like Switzerland, Italy, France and Germany. Right, right. There's a, there's a very big market. I do remember any travels I had on the continent and going into a restaurant in Italy, for example, and seeing perch on the menu, on most menus that you go into in most restaurants. Yeah. And think, I thought to myself, that's a bit unusual, perch. perch but it's yeah. very common on the continent. It is, it is. A very, it's, a, it's a kind of, a, it's a big tradition in Switzerland, uh, to be eating perch. It's just the same way that we eat beef here in Ireland. Yes, I understand. Yeah, yeah. But where do they get their perch from normally? Would, uh, would, they, would there be plants like this all no, over, all over no, Europe? No, no, no. no, no. no not. They, uh, they have tried them in, in Europe, but they didn't, uh, they weren't so uh, successful as we were. I understand. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. they give up sort of after. The fingerlings died on them and then the diseases got in and all things like that, you know, so they're sort of quit. So, but, uh, but us by getting into this, we sort of took it by the horn, because uh, myself and two other partners in this, you know, yes, yes. so we sort of took this on and kept at it. Well, know? why are you successful and they weren't successful over there? Is it to do with the water or to do with the it's stock could, of fish or what? It, uh, it, 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 it'd be a combination of a lot of things, Joe, but uh, water would be a big thing. That you have to, uh, uh, the things that perch that we have found that uh, the perch thrive in is clean water, oxygen and being fed. And being fed. John farms what he calls a 50-ton unit, 
but he has plans to quadruple production in years to come. One of the things that he's most proud of in his two years of operation so far is the way in which the wastewater that he produces is recycled. The wastewater comes out down into that settling tank down at the bottom. Yes. Yeah, it uh, settles down, then the water is flowing into the first pond, into the second, and then into this pond here. So and a succession of three of them, in yeah, other words. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Right. And all these, all these reeds here, these bulrushes, as they're called, I don't know the, uh, the saying name for them, yeah. but it takes all the nutrients out of the water, and then the water can be reused if we need to, uh, but that water goes back into the systems and down into the river. So it's a nice, clean, ecologically friendly system, exactly. in other words. Exactly. Right? It, 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 has, it has no effect at all on the environment. And that was an important aspect yes. of setting up this business. Yes, right? yes. Why you only perch? This is the thing that struck me when we were looking at those fish in there. Now, we know there's a market for perch because, yeah, yeah. The, as you say, the, the alpine countries all love to have perch on their menus. Yes. But why just perch? I mean, because in the past, when people were fishing for coarse fish, I mean, I know, I know that bream was one of the yeah. fish that people wanted to go for as well. Have you, have you thought of diversifying at all? Well, uh, uh, I don't know about the bream, but somebody else did mention about maybe he is a farm pike, you know. Pike? Pike. But, I, uh, but from what I gather from a pike, you'd end up, you may start off at a half a million, but you'd end up with one big one. <laughs> you'd eat all the rest of them. <laughs> because they'll all eat one another, you know. Ah, that's so, I never uh, thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, as any pike will tell you, the proof of the perch is in the eating. So, in the nearby processing plant, we don milk-white wellies and unfetching but essential hairnets in order to enter the clinically hygienic preparation area, where the perch are descaled and filleted. Normally, they would then be dispatched to the continent. But, just to prove that his heart is in Bally Bay, John supplies some to his friend Kieran in the town, and he, in turn, provides us, served up in true alpine style, with perch a la Kieran. This is, oh, that looks gorgeous. This is poached perch. Poached perch? Yeah, Florentine. It's uh, with them with spinach and uh, cheese sauce. It looks absolutely gorgeous. And yeah. a, nice, a nice little rosy tomato on the top of it oh, as well. Oh, a little genus as well. It didn't take you long to do that, Kieran. Uh, that was, well, it's a white fish, so it cooks very, very quickly. Yes. We can't heat this up and not let just tie them. That's delicious. I'm, like that. I'm not just saying that because you're standing there, it is delicious. It really is, seriously. It's delicious. I didn't bring a big knife from the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> it really is gorgeous. It's good. And do you find, is it popular, Kieran, or most your Yeah, it, it yeah. took a while to get people used to ordering it, but once they've had it once, they will reorder. It, yes. Yeah. It's uh, become very, very popular with us now. And you do it a couple of different ways, do you? Yeah. Or is this... we, uh, we can deep fry it in a, a light tempura batter. Mm. It goes very well that way. You can pan fry it. Uh, it's, it's a very durable fish. It, 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 you can cook it in many different ways. It'll even bake if you stuff it. All right, at that joke. I think that's gorgeous. Mm. I think we have to leave a wee bit for certain other people. <laughs> you also have a wee go at it as well. Very good. <laughs> By the time we come back, this plate will have been picked clean, and I'll be telling the story of Crazy Jane. Mystery still surrounds the whereabouts of the final resting place of Crazy Jane. By the time of her death in the early 1800s, she was so famous that poems and ballads were written about her, and tradition has it that she was buried in her best silver-mounted hunting harness. Yes, Crazy Jane was a horse. The celebrated mare who won the Coot Cup for the Jacksons several times between 1804 and 1807. She was, if you like, the Master McGrath of the horse world. And yet, she was a horse of humble origins. She arrived at nearby Creve one day as the workhorse of a fishmonger who had come there to sell two crates of fish to the mill workers. Now, the day after he arrived, the fishmonger fell ill and was put to bed by some kindly soul, and the horse was put in a nearby field to graze. It so happened that the hunt passed by, and the horse was so excited by all the commotion that she took off and raced after it, running and jumping all day and showing a clean pair of hooves to all pursuers. John Jackson was so impressed with the mare that he bought her off the fishmonger for three pounds. But it took the best efforts of several experienced men to overcome her friskiness and get a saddle on her back. And that's when she was dubbed Crazy Jane. No, there's not much likelihood that this is one of Crazy Jane's descendants. There is still any amount of prize horse flesh in the Bally Bay area. 
Towards the latter half of the 19th century, the town was famous for its horse fairs, and a man called Rafe Robinson was one of the busiest horse dealers in Europe. Right up to the time of the First World War, he was a supplier of horses for the cavalry regiments of England, France, Germany and Russia. The horses that Gladys McCardle and her husband Eamon care for at Drumhoyan Stud will not be taking part in any cavalry charges. But who knows what's in store for their offspring? In this section of the stud farm are the brood mares with their pampered foals, living in a kind of cross between a horse hotel and a maternity unit. Whilst over in this section, the stallions are leading the life of Riley. Their only purpose for being here is to breed, to procreate, to pass on their highly prized genes to a new generation yet to be born. Gladys and Eamon are here to help them do just that. But not just any old stallion can get full board here. Gladys not only knows each one's seed, breed and generation, she knows their personalities as well. It's rare to get a stallion that's extremely difficult. Yeah. This is Arkin, Arkin. and this is... Arkin was bred in the UK, right. and he's a son of Arco, Nick Skelton's international show jumping stallion. So um, he comes from a distinguished pedigree, in other words, is yeah, that what you're saying, top, yes? Top show jumping, yes. top performance yes. pedigree. Yeah, and he's fond of you, obviously. He is. Are you fond of them as well, Gladys? Would that be the case? Did you, you develop a wee sort yeah, of friendship to, with them? Yeah, you have to love them. Yeah. You have to have the interest to. in them. Yeah. yeah, and he knows his limits. <laughs> <laughs> no more, Archie. <laughs> yeah, but, okay. they, but they can be, because they're stallions, they're, they can be temperamental as yeah, well, Yeah, they can't must they? be treated as stallions, but... Uh, yes, in other um, words, just be a wee bit more yeah, care careful. 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 Yes, yes. Uh, respect them, and then they'll always respect you too. Yeah, yeah. This is um, Hold Up Premier. And Hold Up Premier. Where did they get the name? Hold from? Up Premier. Well, I didn't have the privilege in naming Hold Up. Yes. He comes from the VDL stud in Holland. Right. Yeah, which is a major European international stud. So he's bar. Dutch, is that the he's idea? French bred, but he's Dutch owned. He's Dutch owned. Yeah. Right, right. Now yeah. he's an older stallion yeah. and he's a proven international Grand Prix show jumper. So these stallions come here having had successful careers as show jumpers themselves, would that be the case? Normally? Yeah, they come here with proven careers, proven show jumping careers yes. behind them. Right. Or in Arkan's case, the potential. Right, because he's got, he's got the bloodline and all that. He has the genetics. Ah, see, yeah. right, right, okay. So hold up has accepted us. So you either have okay. to have done it yourself or else your da has to have been pretty good yeah, at it. Well related. Say that. Well related. Well related. In other words, right. Yeah. This is a finer looking yeah, stallion, am I right? This is um, a new addition to us this season. Yes. Very, very appropriately, appropriately named. Um, he's called Road to Happiness. Road to Happiness. Uh, happy happy yeah. is his pet name and Happy is a thoroughbred stallion. I see. Yeah. These stallions that you have here, Gladys, the, some of these are your own stallions and some you're saying you, you have them more or less on, on a kind of a contract for a while. Is that the idea? Yeah, the majority of the stallions we own. Yes. And in the case of three of the stallions that are here, Hold up Premier right. from Holland from the VDL stud yeah. and we'll move on to Ringford Cruise from Northern Ireland. Is that, is that the, the, the grey, white horse. the white horse? Yeah. Do you call him grey or white? In this um, bright grey, bright, white. White, no, no right. in his okay. case. Yeah. He looks kind of anxious to get talking to him yeah. at least, doesn't he's he? He's jealous of attention going somewhere Oh really, else. is that the yes. idea? Right, yeah. right. This is Ramiro B. Ramiro B is very quiet, uh, quietly yeah. patient in the background there. Yeah, yes. has been here and has been all around Ireland and yeah, yeah. knows what to do. And yeah. Perfect gentleman. Perfect gentleman. A proven sire at this stage. Yeah. Right. This is Cavalier 2 for Joy. Cavalier 2 for Joy. Yeah, and Cavalier 2 for Joy, he reckons he's a boss. Right. He's been our longest serving stallion. Right. Has he got <laughs> um, an air of authority about him? Has yeah, he? Yes, an air yes, of authority, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was bred by Oop. my husband, Eamon. Yeah. And he, he's a coloured stallion. I know you can't see the colour on him just as he stands there. Yeah, yeah. But um, a very, very popular uh, coloured sire mm. in Ireland. It's lovely. I love that mane, the way he's got that. Yeah, his mane has been left very yeah. natural. Hey, that's nice, um, that. He's white looking or something. Yeah. Else, you know? he's, um, he has, he's proven his case and he's been very popular. And thanks to him, we've got been able to build and use uh, yeah. his returns. So he's he's one of your bankers? He's, he has been a yes, banker to yes, us, yeah. He has now been this, a this, this chap here has been making a lot of noise and fuss since we came yeah. into the yard. This and it's because we weren't paying attention, is that right? Yes, now he's happy. Right, right. Yeah. This is Ringford Cruise. Ringford Cruise. Yes. Right. Owned by his breeder, 
Diane Harren Eakin from the north of Ireland right. and Ringford Cruz, bred by Diane by the legendary Irish show jumping stallion Cruzy. He's nodding his head as if he, if he agrees with everything you're saying yes, there. Yes, he, he understands. I think so. <laughs> so he was mm. produced um, as a young horse by Paul Dillon in County Armagh. Yes. And then he went to the Irish Army and he competed up to an at international level with the Irish Army. The mutual affection between Gladys and her charges is obvious. She treats them like members of one big family, even if they are visitors, like this Connemara pony. Mighty man, he's called, on lease from one of the oldest Connemara stud farms in, would you believe, Germany. Nor do you have to be a glamorous show jumper. You can be a sturdy but, to my eye, no less beautiful workhorse, like this Irish draft stallion you're about to see. Hello. Hello, Mike. Um, this is Kilcotton Cross. And oh, Kil Cotton Cross? Yes, Kilcotton Cross. Mike. Oh, look at that. That's a most beautiful yeah. horse. Lots of power and strength with him. Yes. And um, just yesterday, uh, another Irish draft stallion that we had, Crystal Crest, yeah. was sold to America. It's kind of a sad parting for you to some extent. A little bit this? sad. Yes, but, yeah. it, but it, as you say, it's a business as well. It's a business, yeah. yeah. And a few years ago, well, quite a few years ago, mm. on my first excursion to buy a stallion, sure. on my own, I was told to um, never let my heart rule my head. <laughs> so from that point of view... Um, You've tried to follow that advice? Yeah, 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 yeah. Once I didn't, and it yeah. cost me a lot. Was this, was this advice from your father? Because I know he, he, he was a horseman as well, isn't that the case? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, my dad, this is where I gained my interest and uh, love of horses. It was from my late dad, who uh, pre stood Clydesdale stallions. Right. And at that time, the, Clydes, or the stallion and there were Clydesdales, they travelled to the local market town, in this case Bally Bay, Bally Bay. and where um, the stallion travelled on a weekly basis to the fair and the breeders brought their mares to the fair. That happened in... In Bally Bay. In Bally Bay, yeah. in, in the towns. Kind of a public... Very public. Public thing, yeah, yes, but yes. accepted and yes. the norm then. The horses didn't care, obviously. No, the horses didn't <laughs> care, no. Right. And... Um, yeah. Accept it, and as I say, um, mm. things have changed. It's it's different now. Yes, it is different now, as Gladys says. It's a business after all, and there's little room for sentiment or romance. These stallions' only real function is to sire offspring, and although that might sound to some like a kind of horsey heaven, they rarely get to meet their mates face to face, so to speak. Nowadays, it's all done by artificial insemination. I'm going to be a bit coy about the actual collection process, not wanting to shatter the romantic illusions of any young stallions who might be watching. Suffice to say that it's a clinical, scientific process whereby the stallion's semen is collected, examined, extended by the addition of fluid, and then injected into the mare at the optimum time. She doesn't mind this process, obviously. Oh, she doesn't mind, no. Sometimes, maybe. You think they might prefer the match? Well, <laughs> you know, it's a business after all, you know. It's a business, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Her feelings don't matter that much. No. A bunch of flowers down again, maybe, you know. <laughs> to eat. The next mare to enter the stall, all the way from Wexford, was inseminated 17 days ago. And Claire Percy, the vet, is about to examine her to see if, in fact, she is pregnant. Are we looking at her insides in that screen, Claire, now at the yeah. moment? Yes. Yeah, so the grey circle in the middle of the screen there. Yeah. That's her uterus. Right. So, and we're just looking to see if there's a fold. This is only after 17 days. Yeah. W what would you expect to see at this stage? Well, I'll just show you now, because that's... So, see that black circle in yes, the middle there? Yes, right. That's right. the fold. That's so she's the 70 fold. Day, 17 yeah, days in fold, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then we just check the rest of the uterus to make sure that there's only one. Or you could have twins, in fact, yeah, could you? Yeah, she could. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? No, or? we don't want twins. Right. Yeah. And then we just check all the way out. Yeah. That's it, then? So that's it. 
everybody, yeah, sure. everybody just be delighted to see the black dot. Yeah. <laughs> because that's the whole point. That's, that's what it's yeah. confirmed that she's pregnant today. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. That's, that's confirmed. Yeah. You're pleased with that then, obviously. Of course, yeah. Right. So you just discovered that there now? I've just know dis it discovered now? that now, yeah, yeah. yeah she's, um, she'll be able now to travel home. Yes, yeah. back to County Wexford. County Wexford, yes, right. that's correct. Okay. Yeah. And she'll be taking back with her something that'll always remind her of her short holiday with those nice humans up there at Drumhoyan Stud near Bally Bay. When we come back, it will be to meet another much more elusive four-legged friend. The Kulderi Lake just outside Bally Bay is just next door to paradise. If you happen to be a nesting great crested grebe, a mallard, a coarse fisherman or a small child. That's because the thoughtful people who run the wetland centre have provided a wonderful floating causeway that takes you right into the centre of the lake and affords you all sorts of vantage points that even small children can safely get to without the use of a boat. But, as my guide Paul Flynn will tell you, the Kulderi Lake is but the beginning if you do have a boat. We have a, a chain of lakes here. A chain of a them? A chain of lakes, like a string of pearls, all the way down to Limerick. Really? Yeah, you can get in your canoe there, set off, head for Cotill, into the Anna Lee, on down into Lahern. Right. Through the through the Valley Connell Canal into the Shannon and all the way. So you're connected the whole way down well, to, the, to the mouth of the, the Shannon. To the mouth the of the Shannon, right. all the way from this from this wee lake here. From this wee lake here. So the, 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 if I were to see this from overhead, I uh, see this lake here and then another one. That's right. Adjoined by that's a stream or something exactly, like that. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Right. And some lovely bridges. Yes. On the way to and fishing all the way. That would, be a, nice, a that would be a nice break, would I would nice think, wouldn't it? Yeah. Get into a wee We'd boat. We'd recommend that. Yeah, 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 the indeed. time, the leisure and oh, the rest of it. And the weather. Well, so you've got to take time. Now, <laughs> yeah. this busy world of ours, we, that's part of the answer. We've yes. got to relax more. I absolutely agree and with that. Yeah. A nice rustic setting we have here. Yeah. And you can just relax. You're doing a very good job selling this now. I think yeah, that's so. very thing. Absolutely, <laughs> it sounds so. I think attractive. it sells itself. It sells like itself. Really, when you look at it and see it and yeah. see the plants and see the vegetation and the animals, it sells yeah. and the wildlife we have here. That yeah, the only thing you've actually added to it is this yeah. brilliant pontoon kind of walk. We've just come along here. You've yeah. got miles and miles of it. I mean, how, oh, how, long, well, how long is it? We've got half a mile of it. Half a mile. Yeah. But it looks. It yeah. looks. It, it looks, looks like long forever no, because we've got plenty mm. of corners on it. Yeah. But it's, it's kind of interesting to walk on because you do get slightly yeah. seasick. Oh, you do, you do, you do. Lake sick. I know, I know. <laughs> what you see in Monaghan here with the drumlins, yeah. we, our roads are all corners on the way. I noticed. So we felt to, uh, with, the, with the pontoon, we put plenty of corners on it as well to I make see. it more interesting. Yeah. A few roundabouts would be handy yeah, as well. It would yeah. be, but, yeah. we're, we're but it's very durable about. stuff, this, isn't it? It certainly is. It's manufactured in Cork, actually, yeah. and it's, it's, it's used extensively now, and it's, it's, it's very good. And, that wears well and no maintenance on it. And is it so far mm. in terms of usage and people taking up the advantage of having a place like this? Are there plenty of groups? Oh, we're very encouraged. This? We're very encouraged with the number of groups, especially young people from the schools, the primary schools and post-primary schools, and mm. some even from university come. Yeah. yeah, but I think this is the this is the, the, the unique feature, this walkway that you, you think have created. So? Well, you see, uh, you can bring children or groups of people to mm. a wetland yeah. and they stand on the bank and look at it. Oh. But here they get a sense of being able to go right out into the middle of it. Of course they can, of course yeah. they can. And that's, that's the whole yeah. point of it. It is. Yeah. And then as well, our, our Bally Bay in the past was a big fishing area, a big tourist area for continental fisher people. And uh, again, we wanted to encourage that, to mm. encourage them back to fish. So would you encourage fishing here as well? Oh, certainly and, do. And, yeah. and, and, uh, so this certainly. is a, a good access for oh, fishing? Oh, right? right. And we have lots of, of, of pike here and roach and bream. And yeah. Tons of freshwater fish. Tons of freshwater fish yeah. as well. Tons so you've actually everything. Yeah. Well, of course we have. And everything, as Paul describes it, includes 65 acres bought by the Bally Bay Development Association, now farmed organically by the Camp Hill community, who also planted five acres of oak woodland. The Wetland Centre is an initiative which blurs any distinction between recreation and education. And Greta McCarran is well used to entertaining groups of school children who, like me, would have spent many an hour engrossed by the pond life at the centre and by Greta's knowledge and enthusiasm. We have a, a, a newts and tadpoles in here. Yeah. Uh, newts actually look like tadpoles when they're young, 
Um, uh, they both live in the pond together quite happily. So would they look the same exactly as, as a, a frog tadpole, in other words, would they? Yes. You uh, couldn't tell any difference between them, no? Well, at certain stages you can't really tell... Th well, I can't tell the difference. Yeah. Um, but a, a, newt, a newt could tell the difference, possibly. A newt, newt. I, hope, I, I would hope a newt could tell <laughs> the difference. But you see here, that's definitely a frog tadpole. Right. Because you can see its hind legs. Ah, in right. frogs, uh, in frogs, the hind legs develop first. I see. Whereas okay. in newts, as they get a little bit older, their front legs develop first. I see. So, so that's how forward. you tell right, the difference. Right. That there's definitely a frog tadpole. It's a frog one. You can see the wee legs starting in that one. Yeah. yeah. Now you were saying they're, when they're born, it's very, very different because a newt lays not not a, like a big spawn like yes. we have in a frog, but a big bunch together. That's right. Individual eggs. That's right. They uh, they. Uh, lay individual eggs and often the mummy newt will hide it under a leaf at the edge of the pond hide it under a leaf. and it'll fall into the pond and that's yeah. where it spends its life then it's there uh, she usually lays about between 200 and 300 eggs maybe uh, april march april may june right and uh, they go into the pond and they live in the pond probably up until uh, august right. and if they're big and strong enough in august then they'll probably be around this size they leave the pond and they spend the winter then in the long, wet grass. Oh, so they don't stay in the water all year round at all? No, they don't. No, no right, they don't. Right. This one here, now, can we tell if this is a male or a female? Or would you know? Uh, uh, no, I, I wouldn't. Males in the in the breeding season, th these are smooth newts that we have in Ireland. Right. And so that's the uh, only kind of newt that we actually have, is a smooth newts. Yes. Are you trying to pick her up? Can you do I'm that? I'm trying. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, I think that might be a male because he's got a nice orange underbelly. I was going to say possibly it's a female because, I mean, it looks pregnant, doesn't it? Cause well, that's right. That's right. It's quite fat. Quite fat. Yes, but it's got a very nice orange underbelly and it doesn't yeah. like me picking it up, so I'll not do that. All right. In fact, we lost any opportunity to pick up the newt because at this point in time, it began to rain rather heavily and Greta and I had to shelter inside the centre. Had we been hardy enough and braved the weather, then this wouldn't have happened. Well, what happened was um, there was a shower of rain. We were earlier on. We had a run inside, Greta and myself, and we left the two trays sitting out here. And you never believe what happened when we came out. The newt had escaped. You don't know whether it's escaped back into the pond or in, into the long, wet grass. Either way, we are newtless. And uh, you, well, I hope you saw it earlier on, because that might be the only <laughs> chance you get to see it. In the meantime, Greta assures me there are more newts in here. This is why we've uh, got the nets. It's a bit um, hit and miss, I think, whether we get a, another newt or not, you know. Our search was in vain, but undeterred, Greta and I resumed our conversation in the absence of said newt. Entirely newtless. Well, if we wait long enough here yeah. for one of these to develop into a newt, <laughs> it'll be, what, several weeks anyway, wouldn't it? It's, it's oh, it is. Week. Yes, yes, absolutely. It'll be mm. August time before they'd be ready to come out of the water. Right. And often they're not even big enough then, so they'll wait until next year. And they'd come out next. How year. long would they actually live? I mean, would they would they live for a few seasons? Well, they're they? sexually mature after three or four years. Really? Yeah, it takes two to three years for them to become sexually mature, and then however long they survive after that, I guess. So they're quite long lived, really, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. I suppose they would be prey um, for the likes of I don't know herons and things like that. Herons that the and case? things like that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's and what pike, you'd of expect. Course. Uh, anything, anything in the water, bigger fish. Yeah. Yeah, uh, they don't like fish, so any fish will have them. I see, you know? yes. Indeed. So in this pond we have no fish, so that's right. why we have uh, such an abundance of newts and tadpoles. We have an abundance of newts. We have your word for that, Greta, OK, at oh, this stage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have, the certainly time. have an abundance of tadpoles. The yeah, newts we are, certainly well, have. We, we, just, we just haven't got the wellies to go out into the depths to go look, looking right, for them properly. That's right. You had another name for newts. You said you were around here they were called man-eaters man as well. They're known as man-eaters around here. But there was another story you told me, which I don't know. I've never heard that before, that newts, there was a cure. And, That's and, right. And, and That's tell right. me about that again. What was, what was well, that locally they believe that if you uh, lick or kiss the underbelly of a newt, it will give you the cure of the burn. A burn? A burn. So if, if somebody has a burn, they'll come to you and I, I guess you touch the burn or whatever and right. it, it relieves the pain of oh, the, the burn. Oh, per the person who licks the underbelly of the newt will have is, the, is the cure. The per has the cure. Yes. You need, you need to be pretty desperate, wouldn't you, I think? Or, 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 in, or in great pain yourself before uh, or you do a great, Or a great believer in, in, in these cures. How could you get yes. a newt to stay still long enough so you could 
like a thunder belly. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah. our newt could either be back in the pond or could have gone away in the oh, long grass. I, I would say it's away in the long grass. We forgot, of course, that these are land animals as well as as well yes. as swimmers. So yes. it just easily got over the top. Oh well, that's how they get out. They get out every August uh, and they leave the pond yeah. and they're out for the winter. I'm so. just going to look underneath this. Do you never know? No, nope, just there. some leaves. Just when you said he was very secretive, I thought, you know, he could be having a laugh. I was wondering, he's one of those things, you know. I'll just try this one as well. No, that's two, that's one's two. Yeah, that's flat. Not there. No, nope. he's gone. We're still newtless. Now, you might be wondering how we're able still to see the newt, if indeed it has escaped. Well, I am cheating a little, but only a little. This is not the same newt that you saw earlier. Greta is nothing if not persistent, and after our talk, in spite of my gloomy expectations, she actually managed to net mute number two. Persistence pays off. Greta actually, just I had given up altogether, but she carried on with the net and found another mute. Of course, having said nearly everything we wanted to say about newts, we almost immediately had to let it go again. You're not going to kiss it now, are you? I am not. Whoopsie. Oh, oh a nice but... orange underbelly. Yes. So they're very much land animals anyway, aren't they, you were saying? Yes, yes, they they're, come to the pond to breed. They're not home in the land as much as yes, in the water. Yes, absolutely. So they genuine like, amphibians, is that what you would call absolutely. them? Absolutely, they like the wet grass, tall wet grass. I think we're so going for a high it, dive it doesn't here. Look, whoopsie, oh. there he goes. <laughs> Happy, I'm sure, to return to the murky depths whence it came.